Good morning. I really hope it's Monday, September 16th, 2024, because I told you I would give you a quarter early update on the cases we are following. However, something came up. It could be Monday afternoon, as you probably have noticed recently. This podcast is rated for a mature audience only. If you are under 18 years old, this content is not for you. Thank you for visiting us. There's plenty of other content on YouTube for you to watch. Have a great day. All content not created by the blue-haired bingo babe, that's me, belongs to its original creator. It is used to substantiate, augment, or exemplify this author's content. It is used under Title 17, Section 107 of U.S. Code, governing fair use for news, education, and critique. This is our regular crawl that we throw in on various episodes to let you know who we are following. And we're going to do things a little differently this time. I'm going to run the crawl and stop on whoever we're talking about currently. I'm running these cases from oldest to newest. So from now on, the newest cases will always be at the end of this crawl. I have to remake this every time I add a case, and I needed a way to do it quickly and easily without messing up the whole slideshow. So here we go. Like a lot of people, Summer Wells was the first missing persons case that we dug into and researched in earnest. And that was, you know, three years ago. And I happened to be sick that summer, so I had a lot of time on my hands. But I also have to say that I made a ton of mistakes, um, and I regret a lot of them. I regret the fact that I was not more even-handed all across the board, even though I tried to be fair to everybody that the spotlight was shined on one after another, after another, after another. Unfortunately, it's been 459 days or 461 or something like that since TBI did an update on her case. And truth be told, there is nothing new after, I don't know, December of 2021. She's got her own playlist here, but it doesn't, it's not populated with a lot of videos. I could, took a different approach on this channel than I did on my primary channel. And so when Sebastian Rogers was reported missing, we had pretty good momentum on this different way of looking at Summer's case, but it didn't take very long, maybe two, three weeks, and publicity on Sebastian Rogers' case overwhelmed uh, what I was doing on Summer's case. Next up is Kishan Williams because he is the next oldest case. And before we go into his updates, I want to say that I have removed Michael Vaughn's case because first of all, I never reported on it. And second, I uh, saw a clip of Brandy Neal the day she found out that the property that Sarah Wandra lived at a block or so away from Brandy's house was being dug up and that she found out from YouTube that some YouTuber had not waited long enough for law enforcement to get in touch with Brandy and her husband to break the news to them. And I watched Brandy cry and I, I thought, crap, you know, Maybe it's not fair that I keep saying that I'm following his case. Even though I am, I'm keeping an eye open for, you know, Idaho to be able to pin the charges on the responsible people. But maybe it's not fair for me to continue to post his picture and talk about him because I did not report on him. I hope that makes sense. Let's move on to Kishan Williams. He goes by the nickname Key, and he was last seen June 17th, 2023, over a year ago. He had a birthday over the holidays last year and is now 16. He was seen, or he was known to have been going to a house party very near where he and his mother, Sharice Snowden, lived. 
and he never returned from that party. He, as Sharice describes him, was a really good kid, got good grades, um, was involved in extracurricular activities, including church, and they had a close relationship. He would, she and he would text back and forth, touching base with each other on a daily basis. And as a matter of fact, on the day that Kishan was missing, he had texted his mother that he was on the way home. And so she expected him shortly. He did not return home, although witnesses spotted him at a different house than the place where the house party was. Witness, other witnesses have come forward and say that they saw him beaten and bloody in the back of an SUV that the police identified right at the beginning of his case. Since then, Cherise Snowden had uh, press conferences and she's pretty angry because she believes that somebody in the neighborhood knows exactly where her son is and is withholding information. Law enforcement did a foliage down search of a parking area near, the, uh, near a church that's in the larger neighborhood just to double check and make sure that there was nothing there of evidentiary value. And there was not. They believe that Key was abducted and, at least as of the time of that press conference, still alive. This is Keyshawn and his mother, Sharice, during Happier Days. A reward of $22,500 is being offered for information that leads to the whereabouts of Williams. Anyone with information about his whereabouts is asked to call Cleveland Police at 216 623-5400 or the number right under his picture. You can also contact the U.S. Marshals Service at 1-866, the number 4, WANTED, W-A-N-T-E-D. Speaking of the U.S. Marshals Service, you may have heard recently during the end of August and into the beginning of September, they did a uh, rescue and they recovered 32 children in Ohio. Unfortunately, Kishon Williams was not one of them. However, we will hold out hope that the lair of whoever abducted him is thoroughly tossed and that Key's whereabouts will become known and he will go through the necessary procedures to be reunited united with his mother. That's our hope and our prayer. Hang in there, Sharice. There are many of us out here whom you have never met who are still pulling for you and still praying for you and Kishan. Next up are the two girls from Roscommon County, Michigan, who went missing just 11 days after Kishan Williams was reported missing in Ohio. The Roscommon County Sheriff's Office told us that Tamara Perez, 15, and her sister Iris Perez, 14, were last seen on June 28th near their home in Prudenville, Roscommon County, Michigan, about 180 miles northwest of Detroit. The sisters and their adoptive parents moved from Florida to Michigan around March of 2023, according to the FBI, just about a year ago. After the girls went missing, the sheriff's department shared images of a white Jeep Cherokee leaving the area where the sisters had been seen. The FBI says Iris has a star tattoo on the left side of her neck. The sisters have ties to Port St. Lucie, Lake Worth, Florida, and Winchester, Tennessee, according to officials. And the FBI got involved because it's believed that they may be endangered and have crossed state lines. Anyone with tips on the Perez sisters' whereabouts is encouraged to contact the Roscommon County Sheriff's Office at 989-275-5101 or the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI.
the cases of these three missing teenagers weighs heavily on me, and the more that time passes, the heavier it feels for me. I don't know why that is. Perhaps it's because they went missing very short time apart within a month of each other and within uh, maybe maybe 350, 400 miles, something like that. I'm speculating off the top of my head because I know I have the map in front of me. And that brings us to our latest case, case that is now almost eight months old, Sebastian Rogers missing from Hendersonville, Tennessee, last seen at about bedtime, 9 p.m., February 25th, 2024, by his mother, who sent him to bed. That was apparently his regular bedtime. The next day was Monday, the 26th, and he had to, you know, get ready for school the next day and so on and so forth. At or around 10 p.m., Katie tells us that she heard a thump or a thud coming from the direction of Sebastian's room, and she called out to him. He responded to her, and she told him, I don't care what you're doing up there. It's time to go to bed, and Sebastian complied. And nothing else was heard from him that night while she was awake, and nothing woke her up. Uh, after she went to bed at midnight, approximately, having had a study session for her classwork for her extended training, as well as having a roughly three-hour conversation with her husband, Chris Proudfoot, who was in Memphis um, for his job as a crane operator at St. Jude's Hospital. All of this has been confirmed both by law enforcement who have not specified those things, but it's also been confirmed by private investigator Chloe and private investigator Heather, both of whom worked for Seth Rogers, Sebastian's father, in their professional capacity, but as volunteers to help Seth try and find his son, despite the fact that he let them go and or fired and or one left voluntarily his services um, shortly within a, two months of volunteering to help him. At six in the morning when Katie Proudfoot went to wake Sebastian for school, she discovered he was not in the house. She did a quick search of the house and the grounds and also during that time frame called Chris Proudfoot, who then subsequently three-waved them into the Sheriff's Office of Sumner County to avoid being picked up by Memphis 911, which would have done them no good because they would have wasted time rerouting the call. Nevertheless, Sumner County and Hendersonville police were there in a very short amount of time. We're talking 8 to 12 minutes. And everything that Katie said she was doing, namely getting in the car, calling for Sebastian, searching for him as far as his high school and so forth, is all uh, documented and is confirmed by police dispatch of which there is a condensed version spanning about 11 hours, I think, done uh, by a YouTuber, which is very helpful and very useful. And I think, you know, maybe we'll go over that information at some time in the future. At about 6.20 in the morning, a call was put in to Seth Rogers by Chris Proudfoot to um, ask him to call because it, there was an urgent situation. But Seth didn't see that until about an hour later, roughly 7.20 a.m., having clocked out of his job at Clark County Sheriff's Office uh, prison or jail, sorry. And he went directly to Katie and Chris Proudfoot's house about an hour away. So he arrived somewhere between 8.15 and 8.45, giving a generous amount of time for morning traffic. By then, the... Uh, presence of law enforcement had changed the momentum as it always does and police 
were already out investigating. There was a canine handler whose partner's name is Max, and they hit on a scent that led to a retaining pond uh, within a half mile of the Proudfoot house. And the dog, apparently following a scent, went right into the retaining pond. That information has not been discussed by law enforcement, but law enforcement did do a very extensive search within a five mile radius and found no evidence of Sebastian. Now that does not mean to say, just because he was not rescued or recovered, that the scent was, uh, that Max picked up was not valid. It means that based on three other dogs who followed the same scent trail from the Proudfoot house and yard to the retaining pond, uh, that there were four dogs who found the same thing. That retaining pond was searched and drained and searched by law enforcement within that five mile radius. And the dive team of NARC divers also went there at the very specific directions of Chris Proudfoot to search themselves and found nothing of evidentiary value. Gray Hughes has debunked something that has been circulating around and around and around for the last seven plus months, and that is a clip of light sometime early morning of uh, February 26th, where uh, both Chris and Seth say the lights that are seen in that little clip of videotape from a neighbor's camera uh, were a trash truck. And people jump up and down and yell about trash trucks not being out at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is the recorded time on that neighbor's camera timestamp is 311. But that does not mean to say that that videotape was actually recorded at 311 a.m. February 26th. The neighbor has been very forthcoming about the fact that the... Um, the recording date time recording part of their camera has been broken for some time. So it is entirely possible that as um, law enforcement Craddock, uh, Deputy Craddock, uh, now Sheriff Craddock, uh, having taken over the top spot, told Nick Barris very early on, the lights are of no evidentiary value. And why would that be? Well because the time stamp and date stamp on the neighbor's clock was broken. Gray Hughes debunked it with the help of Chris Proudfoot having gone over that whole um, piece of video. So let's not drop details off of the story just because it doesn't fit a scenario that is straight out of a, you know, espionage novel. There are a couple of details about Sebastian presumed to be correct in that it is said he left without shoes, meaning uh, without shoes on his feet. Uh, that's confirmed by all his shoes and his pair of boots being still by the door. So all the shoes from the Proudfoot home are accounted for. He left with no jacket. Now that was a, an unseasonably warm night. People who say that it was you know, freezing cold. No, it wasn't. It was in the high 50s or maybe 60 degrees around the time frame that he would have gone missing sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, there was a temperature drop a couple of days later where it did get cold and people got very concerned about his whereabouts and well-being in cold weather. But at that time, on that night, it was it was a warm night. It is also... so. He, it's been said he left without a jacket, and one could understand why, if he didn't leave up of his own volition, he would leave without a jacket if he was planning to come right back in the house. Uh, but we don't know that. We just know barefoot. No, let me rephrase that. We just know 
that he did not have the shoes Katie expected him to have. He did not have a jacket. And the only thing missing out of the house that Katie could identify, and she's never changed her story, was a small pocket flashlight. Phone was left uh, on the kitchen counter charging where it's supposed to be. The switch was located in the house, the you know gaming console called switch. So these are troubling details that we can't not remember. We have to keep these details intact in their order. They um, have either been confirmed by Katie, some of these things have been confirmed by Chris and or Seth, and some of these things have been confirmed by law enforcement. Law enforcement searched a massive ground search. There's a brilliant grid map um, from command center that shows everywhere they searched. The caves were searched if they were not already collapsed and too dangerous. And this went on for eight days when then Deputy Chief Credit came out and did an interview stating that they were going to switch from ground search, grid searches, and concentrate on the investigative side, which is what you do when you come up empty in such an extensive search. Since then, uh, Chris and Katie have done a number of interviews on YouTube channel holders platforms, as well as some local television interviews and Nancy Grace. And I think Katie did one by herself with a creator called Reels. I saw it. I don't know anything about Reels, but I did see the interview. Katie's demeanor has been, I would say, for at least the first three months, really shook up. And all you have to do is look at either the first interview that Duchess Discussions did with Trev Time 2023 uh, as co-host, where she could barely talk. And it's evident. All you have to do is listen. The next day, she did um, a local news interview. It was a four-part interview, so it broke up, you know, into these four parts. And she was there with Chris talking about that night, and she was rocking because she was so upset and trying to soothe herself so she could get through this interview. Go back and look at the interview, turn the sound off, forget what they're saying, and just watch her behavior. Her face is red, she can barely keep her composure. And it took her a long time to be able to talk extemporaneously about that day, about the, that night, and about Sebastian without breaking up. Uh, it, it just is what it is. I took a lot of heat for defending the reasons why Candace Wells does not want to appear on camera and was reluctant to appear on camera in the first 13 days. She did release a statement with her mother long before that, I think on day two or day three. Nevertheless, I was criticized for explaining, you know, how much trauma she was under and how she was having difficulty keeping her composure. And, you know, the criticism was like an avalanche. So this time I decided, okay, I'm going to not be defensive of uh, Sebastian's mother, and but I still defended her somewhat. I was on board with everything Seth showed us he was doing in the first month or so until his behavior started changing. And I then said, no, this, this, I can't support this behavior anymore. And I haven't changed my position since. I don't believe any of these three parents had anything to do with their son's disappearance. However, there's a lot of disconnected puzzle pieces that if you eliminate the gaps, you could create a scenario where one or both of uh, mom and stepfather, you know, did something or their extended family, or you could flip that on its head and say dad and or his extended family and friends did something. I don't believe any of that. I don't see enough supportive evidence 
without gaps in between. And it's the gaps in between that we are missing. Law enforcement has those pieces. We do not. Just as in the case of Summer Wells, the FBI card team was involved from the very beginning, examining what local law enforcement had turned up and making a determination about whether they needed to be boots on the ground continuously or whether they could write a report and then monitor the situation, which is what they did. And on August 26, 2021, they got involved and publicized the fact that they were issuing up to a $50,000 reward for information on the whereabouts and well-being of Sebastian Rogers. And that's where we stand today, three weeks later. I have already expressed my uh, opinion and done my research on any outside entities who have joined in the uh, efforts from outside sources. And so I won't go into it here because I've already kept you way longer than normal. And if you have stuck around this long, your continued support is so much appreciated. It's why I do these things to inform the public not monetized, don't have any plans to monetize, and I don't live stream, although I can if I want to. However, for the time being, I prefer to just report on the missing persons cases part of this channel's content without the added complications of monetization and or live streaming. Does that cut my audience down greatly? It sure does. Because there is a perception out there that the only people worth listening to are live streamers. And I beg to differ. There are a bunch of us who don't live stream, but do produce fact-based content to the best of our ability. One thing we don't do during these quarterly updates is tell you about all the successes law enforcement has had that we have reported on. And I can't, I can't figure out if I skipped the second quarter update or not. I don't think I did, but I know that this update was long overdue. And instead of doing a quarterly update in late November or towards the end of December, I think we will just touch on the fact that we have had very many successes uh, despite the troubling nature of these unsuccessful cases to date. Thank you so much for joining me. God bless you, and I will see you real soon.